Hello there, fellow kids, and welcome to episode 14? 14? Yep, 14. it is 14. <laughs> I just told episode. you right before recording. Yeah, well, yeah, it is. It's episode 14. Fully endorsed. With me, as always, is uh, Andres Perez on his own channel. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, people of the internet. And boy, have we got an episode for you today. Indeed, indeed. You know, it's... It's an interesting time in the world right now, and so no better time than now than to make a bunch of jokes about Asian people. Because today, <laughs> we are going to be discussing uh, Enter the Dragon from 1973, a Bruce Lee joint. Uh, uh, so, Andreas, yes. Enter the Dragon, mm -hmm. you've never seen a Bruce Lee movie before, I, I, correct? Correct. Um, Bruce Lee, uh, of course I knew who Bruce Lee was due to the, in, you know, the pop culture zeitgeist. You right. know, him being the one of the most, if not the most prolific martial arts actor of all time. And so uh, I have seen, I have been exposed to the, the sort of the pop culture uh, of the legacy of Bruce Lee through pop culture media. You know, whether it comes to like parodies, homages, all that kind of stuff. Whether it's like a uh, um, what was the character? Fei, I think it was, was it Fei Long? Fei Long from Street Fighter 2, or, uh, uh, what was the main character from, uh, from, uh, Mortal Kombat? Liu Kang. Liu Kang, yes. Liu Kang from, from... I'm gonna be doing, I'm gonna be doing a lot of talking about Mortal Kombat in this episode. <laughs> right, oh yeah, yeah, there's tons of, of, like, this, this movie, here. it's like, it's very interesting, like, watching this movie... Because it's like so much of pop culture has parodied this uh, particular movie, so it was really exciting to have finally seen like the sort of the originator of of all the sort of tournament mar martial art tournament based uh, storylines in in pop culture yeah. and media. For those of you who don't know, uh, Ed Boon and John Tobias, the guys who created Mortal Kombat, they uh, drew a lot of inspiration. By the way, hi, I'm a I'm obsessed with Mortal Kombat. It's my favorite video <laughs> game franchise of all time. And recently there's been a lot of Mortal Kombat content to keep that ex obsession uh, uh, flowing strong. Co content uh, with a K? Content with a, with a hard K. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, John Tobias and Ed Boon, the creators of Mortal Kombat. Uh, I believe it's John. Anyway, um, they, uh, they drew inspiration from uh, all kinds of pop culture that they loved. Uh, most notably, two films... Uh, in, uh, one being Enter the Dragon. The plot of Mortal Kombat is very similar to uh, to Enter the Dragon, the first game, anyway. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then another one being a Big Trouble in Little China, from which they uh, grasped uh, not only some character designs, but also some, you know, some of the more like mystical, like Chinese, like sorcery and monsters and stuff like that, mm -hmm. as well as a host of other influences. But those are really the two the two big ones. So that's why that's why Mortal Kombat comes up in this discussion for anybody listening who perhaps doesn't have that context. Andres, did you have much exposure at all to um, martial arts cinema outside of Bruce Lee? Uh, let's see. Uh, the closest would probably be like. Um, a lot of Jackie Chan's films back in the day, like Rush Hour, the Rush Hour trilogy, um, I guess Kung Fu Panda, if you want to count that. Um, sure, why see. not? But I, I guess Power Rangers, if you want to count that as well, because I know like as a, as a child of the 90s, like me and so many other kids like went to after school martial arts uh took martial after school martial arts classes as a result of the you know inspired by our, our love for power rangers and wanting to defend ourselves and kick as much ass as, as the the teenagers with attitude so it's like i've had like various oh and i did see was it the the martial arts uh movie uh hero with, with jet Li, and oh nice that's saw, a good one uh, i believe it was I think it was Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragons, or maybe it was something else. Like House... No, uh, I don't know. It was, it was another one of those like wire fook type of uh, martial arts movies beyond Hero. You might have been talking about House of the Flying Daggers? I think it was House of Flying Daggers. Yeah, I might have seen that movie in, in college. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that is pretty much the uh, extent of my martial arts 
uh, exposure, I guess. Everything else is just well, probably like, you know, incidental, you know, like I said, uh, parodies and and homages and stuff like that. Like one-off parodies and homages within other forms of media. Let's not forget, um, one that I know you've seen is, of course, uh, Quentin Tarantino's Kill Bill. Oh, Newology. yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, you see, yeah. with Kill Bill, I always th- see it as like this like hybrid of like of a samurai movie with martial and a martial arts movie and a cowboy movie, like all wrapped yeah. up into one package. So I never really saw it as like a so- strictly martial arts film. It is a lot of things, but I think especially Volume One um, leans so heavily into the martial arts that, uh, especially in that third act, mm-hmm. that I think you can safely call that one a martial arts movie. Okay. Two is where two is where it gets a whole lot more westerny, really. Hmm. Volume two, okay. um, and of course you've also seen a uh, Super Inframan, and that's uh... yeah. Oh, um, I guess you can add uh, the first season, the first season of uh, of uh, Iron Fist, and I guess to an extent um, Daredevil. All three sure. seasons of Daredevil, if that counts sure. as martial arts. I mean, any any American action film that is borrowed heavily from like martial arts stuff. I mean, I guess you could lump in there, you know. Yeah. Look at look at some of the stuff from like Batman Begins. I guess what you can see of it when the camera's not cutting around. Right. It. Uh, <laughs> like but... you, you can say like certain action heroes, like like John Claude Van Damme would be all about the martial arts, but then people more like like Sylvester Stallone or Schwarzenegger, they're not so much about the martial arts. They're just all focused on shooting guns and hitting really really hard. Oh, Dragon Ball! Dragon Ball's another big franchise that I'm sure oh, yeah, has obviously. been influenced yeah. heavily from not only Chinese mythology initially, but also just a lot of stuff that Akira Toriyama was a fan of, especially, you know, martial arts films. Yeah, and Bruce Lee, there are direct Bruce Lee parodies in episodes of Dragon Ball Z. Um, so, yeah, that, that's all very valid. Um, and then you, of course, have uh, uh, action stars like Steven Seagal, who is sort of into the martial arts but more so into the donuts uh <laughs> yeah so you so you had a very sort of passing uh uh relationship to martial arts movies you you've, you've seen a lot of stuff that's influenced by it but you haven't really delved into the to, to the core genre all that much right. so uh, as as your first exposure to bruce lee why don't you give your um very general thoughts about Enter the dragon and then we can uh, get into the nitty-gritty of course. Uh, let's see. So my initial thoughts on Enter the Dragon. So it's it's one of those things where as a sort of a piece of, I guess, what I like to call legacy content, you know, content that other that would go on to inspire other forms of media to then, you know, take what it the the, the bases and sort of build upon that. There is always the risk that because so many Media, so much media has copied the original, uh, the original media that the original form may be seen as like antiquated, in retro, ret, in, it might become retroactively antiquated or outdated or cliche because it's been copied so many times over and over again. However, I can confidently say that that is not the case for um, Enter the Dragon because, for as basic as it may appear from the outset, you know, on the outside. At the end of the day, nobody can do Bruce Lee better than Bruce Lee. And so... No, and they sure have tried. (laughs) Right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember, what was it, that John Bellotti Jr. was on a podcast with his friends, and uh, I I listened to him talk about, like, the, the state of... the evolution of martial arts media and mentioned how... You know, like they tried bringing up like Jackie Chan and Jet Li as like the next Bruce Lee's, but they could never fully hold a candle to to his work. And um, yeah, definitely like he brings a sort of unique edge to the Kung Fu, you know, martial arts genre of of action films. And so he'll take any base uh, from from the outset, you know, for as someone barely taking a look at at uh bruce lee's career i can only assume that he can take like the barest forms of storytelling and use it as a platform to bring you the most mind the most mind-blowing like action fight scenes imaginable that still hold the test of time to this very day yeah that's fair i I don't think any of the bruce lee films are especially plotty right um i'm I'm assuming it's like with the the... the exception of uh Uh with the exception of game of death but that's an unfortunate situation uh he had died 
long before right. he could oh, get it finished, okay. and they had to jump through hoops to get, finish that movie. I forgot. I did see Dragon the Bruce Lee story, and I remember I asked you this question and you didn't know, but I'm very curious to know what the general consensus is on the the Bruce Lee, you know, life story, uh, what do you call it, Bio, the, the Bruce Lee biopic, Dragon. Because I, found, I I always found it entertaining, and it always popped up on TV, so I end up watching it multiple times. Yeah, well, I don't know, but uh, how about a quick cursory Google search, and I'll uh, I'll tell you what I can find here. Okay, um, let's see what the what them Rotten Tomatoes have to say about Dragon. Let's hear from the majority. Um, let's see. The unsilent majority, Big Mouth. <laughs> uh, what's that here? On IMDb, it's got a 7 out of 10 rating. Okay. Where's Rotten Tomatoes? Here we go. What do we got here? A 71% from critics and a 79% from audiences. Okay, then. So I guess people see it as a decent film. So what do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Be sure to comment below and be sure to like and subscribe. And fuck Lee and ring that bell. Now, you do whatever you want to do, folks. Uh, yeah, so I also wanted to bring that up. I did... I did. I am aware of like you know like of uh, you know with Dragon the Bruce Lee story. I am aware of like the cliff notes of Bruce Lee's career, of him coming to to America, um, you know becoming an actor, working on the Green Hornet. Uh, he almost appeared in the series Kung Fu, but instead it was David Carradine. Went to China, became a big movie star, and eventually sort of everything went full circle by doing a collaboration with Hollywood, which resulted in this movie here. Right. Did you know about his um, his early film appearances when he was a child? Uh, no, I did not. His father was like a, a famous like Chinese like um, like comedian type guy. Um, oh. Think of him as like think of him as like Chinese Groucho Marx or something in that vein. And uh, and early on as a child, Bruce Lee had a few like little just little bit parts. Basically, he didn't like like nothing huge. Um, uh, and then uh, as a teenager, he, he got involved in martial arts because he got beat up in a street fight. And then he started getting into more fights as a teenager. And that's ultimately why they sent him to America to, to live with a, a, I don't remember if it was a relative or a family friend, mm -hmm. because apparently fighting is just straight up illegal in Hong Kong. And they were right. afraid that he was going to get into some serious trouble. Well, that's what um, makes the, the plot of this movie, the early parts of this movie make a lot more sense. Yeah. So then he, he came to America and like you said, he got involved in TV, did the Green Hornet. He also on the side was teaching martial arts to a lot of famous people. Hmm. Oh, that was the thing. Um, yeah, he, he entered, I guess he sort of introduced the concept of teaching non-Chinese people the art of martial arts. Yeah, there's a famous incident where um, basically all the Chinese like martial arts schools that were in America were like trying to get him to stop and apparently they sent a challenger to his school mm -hmm. to challenge him to a fight and the, the terms of the fight was that if he lost he had to close the school and if he won that they would leave him alone mm -hmm. and uh, he, he won the fight so uh, now we have martial <laughs> did, now we have martial arts in America right <laughs> congratulations everybody we did it we we what, what do you call it? we appropriated their culture yeah, they, they they fucking appropriated it themselves and handed it to us. Th that is true. Uh, <laughs> we have Bruce to thank for that. Uh, and what I mean, was he basically, yeah. he, he also um, basically invented mixed martial arts because he was one of the first guys to say, you know, fuck these traditional styles because they all have these huge flaws. I'm I'm a, I'm a take from everything and put them together. You know, his original study was Wing Chun. He studied under the the great Wing Chun grandmaster Ip Man. But we're, that's a movie we'll cover at some point. Okay. Um, and then he, uh, but yeah, he, t he took a little bit of everything, even like, you know, incorporating like Western, like boxing in there. Uh, you'll notice that a lot of his footwork feels like uh, he, he was very inspired by like uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, like a butterfly, sting like a bee. Yeah. And so he, the he adventures did... of Muhammad Ali. <laughs> yeah. So he created his own martial art, Jeet Kune Do, uh, which somebody pointed this out mm -hmm. in a, because I, I watched him. Um, on the DVD for Enter the Dragon, there's a whole like documentary about his whole like life story, and that's that's uh, where they were talking about this. Mm. Um, he you know he created Jeet Kune Do after having moved to America, and he he did all of that stuff over here. So technically, Jeet Kune Do is an American martial art form. 
Wow, uh, okay, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so we got one. <laughs> we got one! <laughs> and also, um, I, I could be wrong, but I think in the anime Cowboy Bebop, the main protagonist, Spike Spiegel, actually uses Jeet Kune Do. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. But yeah, he taught it to a lot of famous people. People like uh, Steve McQueen Ooh. and K- Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, nice. And he ended up appearing in, uh, what was it, Game of Death? Game of Death, yeah. Yeah, all right. That is a movie that we will not watch here, because I cannot fully endorse Game of Death. <laughs> For obvious reasons. It, it's You should see it at some point as a curiosity, but, yeah. uh, but, but, uh, but I can't fully endorse it. <laughs> you, you'd think that movie would have been remade in like, the way Lee would have wanted it to have been made. Yeah, you'd think that somebody would try to do that. Instead, Jet Li remade Fists of Fury, which is one of his best ones. Right, that's weird. Well, anyways, uh, so yeah, as for Enter the Dragon, you recommended this movie because this was the most famous one, am I correct? Yeah. Well, I gave you a choice, if you remember. Ah, yes. I, I said we can either watch Enter the Dragon because that's his most famous one, and that's the one that really, like, made him a legend, like, in the States and worldwide. Yeah. Um, or we could talk about... Um, the big boss which was his first movie in china after he moved back to china Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, you chose enter the dragon right uh so yeah that's how that happened right and so uh i i'm definitely glad that i chose enter the dragon because now i'm aware of just how influential this movie was in in terms of like the history of, of of entertainment and so now i have a much greater appreciation for everything that came afterwards, as well as, you know, the the original thing that started it all. Um, so I guess to go into the story, you know, like I sort of like hinted at it, this is essentially like the very first time, or not maybe not so much the very first time, but this is essentially the movie that inspired the whole uh, evil uh, evil antagonist starts a a competition a turn a martial arts tournament for various competitors to come to a nice uh, uh, remote island and the main pr- the main protagonist has to end up fighting a bunch of villains uh, in a sequential order before eventually confronting the big boss the main boss big boss <laughs> himself yeah. yeah again it's Mortal Kombat uh, if you haven't ever played Mortal Kombat or seen any of the films then you've probably seen that spongebob episode like you, you've seen yes you've where, seen San, where sandy was the the it was straight up all even dressed up as bruce lee in that as game of, in game of death yeah so um it's very influential that's for sure one thing that uh that you pointed out mm-hmm. um is that aside from being a martial arts movie which obviously it is it's also a spy thriller yes yes um, you, I, you can definitely tell this was very much so in the 70s, you know, like James Bond was was at an all time high. And uh, mm. so we had uh, Bruce Lee, uh, who was playing a character named Lee, which makes it so much easier for me to remember his name. Uh, he gets uh, recruited by, I believe, the British intelligence. And they're saying, we want you to find this terrorist because he is recruiting uh, henchmen through this op- through this op- tournament operation. We want you to go in there and kick his ass because apparently we're not allowed to use guns. And right. Lee was like, no. And then the, they were like, well, this is, I'll have you know that the person who killed your sister happens to be part of this tournament. And he was like, oh. And then he ends up joining the, the <laughs> tournament. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. Don't be. Um. <laughs> and on top of that, uh, there's also uh, John Saxon, who you mentioned before, or was the person who played uh, Laurie's father in Halloween? Nope. No. It was a different Close, father. but no cigar. He was okay. the father of Nancy in Nightmare on Elm Street. Ah, I got the wrong slasher movie. Damn it. Okay. You did. You did. I fucked up. <laughs> I done fucked up. Uh, so John Saxon, he is playing Roper. Who uh, who is Roper again? What was his backstory? He's like a he was like a wealthy like industrialist, but I guess well not so wealthy because apparently he was like in debt to some some bad people. Right, and they're constantly so, uh, trying to to kick his ass, only for him to kick their asses instead. Yeah, so he's going 
on this to this tournament. Was there prize money? Did they mention anything about prize money? I'm not there must have been. sure, but I think he was just invited. Maybe. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, go ahead. And then the other main character is um, I don't remember him, so I'm just was, gonna have to say it. It, it was the William. black guy. <laughs> it was Willie. His name was Williams. Looking at the Wikipedia Will- article here. Williams, thank you. Yeah, uh, who's played, played by Jim Kelly? Yes. Uh, uh, do you who know? Also, it? Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Who, who was also uh, great in the movie? <laughs> yes, yeah. So William T is just another competitor who has apparently known Roper previously from prior tournaments beforehand. And so, uh, yeah, right they have on. a really uh-huh. they have a really fun back and forth, which is useful because none of the characters really know Bruce Lee character right. and so it's nice to have two characters who do know e- know each other who can sort of banter and uh help move things along very true yeah and i guess there is some banter between roper and lee uh later in the film as uh both of them eventually come to an uh an ag- they, they form an alliance against the main villain han and yep. uh Oh, I mentioned. Uh, I meant uh, to mention before when we were talking about how this is a, a spy thriller. Yeah. The guy who did the music to this movie, which is super great and iconic in its own right, mm-hmm. uh, apparently did the music for the original like Mission Impossible like TV series. Oh wow! So uh, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess like to get it out of the way, the music itself is really beautiful. It's like a very interesting mixing of genres. We definitely have a lot of like seventies funk and disco. Um, you know, some cla- some classic, uh, what do you call orchestral scores, and, you know, a lot of uh, traditional Chinese uh, instrumentals. So, yeah, and, it, and it has a very sort of James Bond-like sound, but it also maintains that sort of oriental flavor, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, a... I definitely say that. And, so it's... Uh... Mm-hmm. It, it, it's a nice blend. Totally. And, you know, much like the score itself, the cast is a very interesting, uh, you know, mixed international, uh, very, very diverse blend of characters here from from various different uh, backgrounds. We have Bruce Lee, who is an expert martial artist, Shaolin martial artist from Hong Kong. We have, uh, you know, John Saxon, who is a very witch, uh, uh, comes from a wealthy uh, you know, upper class, high class uh, society, uh, and Williams appears to you know be someone who is start. I don't know from what we've gathered, he's apparently someone who has faced a lot, uh, faced a lot of oppression from society, and he you know pretty much is rising his way to the rising his way to the top as an outsider, both as you know being a black man in America as well as being an outside foreigner in a martial arts tournament. And uh, it's so interesting that when like, when we're introduced to all three of these characters, each of them gets to have a prolonged uh, flashback. With Bruce Lee, it involves the death of his sister, which is like a main motivation, driving motivation for him to want to come go to this tournament. For John Saxon, is him being ambushed by a bunch of thugs, assassins on a golf course. And for Jim Kelly, he's... Uh, Attacked by two white co- racist white cops, and I couldn't help but say, "Gee, this is very topical for today, given the social climate right now." Yeah, total accident, by the way. Uh, yes, um, I, I think the record will show. Or no, it won't actually, because we haven't actually posted the episode yet. But, but the record would, if these episodes had been posted when they were recorded, the record would show that I recommended this movie prior to uh, all of the shenanigans that have gone on. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it, it's just its just one of those, like, life is stranger than fiction things where we end up watching this thing at the same time what was going on in America is happening at that moment. And for those of you who yeah. don't know, watch the news. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, anyways... Strap up, look yeah. at a popcorn and strap in. Uh... <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I feel like each of these characters definitely brings, uh, you know, a, a very interesting things to the table here. Uh, Bruce is a very stoic character. He definitely does not... Ha- I feel like his character is not particularly all that deep, but I feel like characters, the more the more light height, lighthearted characters like Roper and Williams do help balance out Lee's uh, stoicism. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, I'd like to point out, um, this is the only mo Bruce Lee movie that you watch mm -hmm. where you get to hear his actual voice. Because um, in all of his other movies, you know, that are produced completely in China, in China, mm -hmm. he's speaking Chinese, and therefore, when he, when we as dumb Americans watch them, mm -hmm. we're watching them dubbed. Right. And I, and I guess you can opt for subtitles, but uh, typically, uh, one watches them dubbed. And um, so this is the this is the only movie where you can just pop it in and hear Bruce Lee in his own voice speaking uh, very good English. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I remember like there like his instructor is like so obviously dubbed because like his voice is just super like uh, super like American with like zero accent whatsoever. And... Yeah, half of the cast is being dubbed into English, mm -hmm. uh, and we're actually speaking Chinese on the set. And then I would assume that uh, re when released in other countries, um, the, the half of the cast that were speaking English were probably being dubbed into Chinese. Right, it's similar to kind of like what happened with Nick Adams and and his and his uh, uh, what do you call them and his uh, uh, co-workers, not co-workers, but and uh, like Nick Adams and the rest of the cast in the several uh, in the in the couple of Toho movies that he was involved in. Yeah. Um. Let's see. And uh, well, uh, what was the thing? Uh, James Earl Jones. Yeah. The the person. Who does who did the voice of of Lee's instructor or his master sounds pretty much like James Earl Jones. Lee, you must go he, there to be. He just he, yeah. He does sound a bit uh, a bit like James Earl Jones, doesn't he? Yeah, that's an interesting observation. I picked up on that. Uh, also, do you happen to know if if Bruce Lee dubbed his own characters for the English dubs of his movies? I do not. I don't. Th think so though okay yeah it, it doesn't sound like like back in those days i don't yeah i don't i doubt that they would probably go out of their way to bring uh, a chinese actor over or to to the states or you know to wherever they're dubbing the movie just to get yeah, him I... to dub that one when they can have like someone from their repertoire of of dub actors right yeah because he's he was working he was living and working exclusively in Hong Kong at that point, and uh, I doubt that they would have flown him over. And, and also, when, when you watch those other movies, it, it just doesn't sound like it's him to me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I don't think that's the case at all. No. Do they try giving him an accent? Uh, not really. It just It's a different voice, you know? Okay, yeah. And as for Han, I can't remember, do they give him an accent? Because I feel like they did for his dubbed voice. I think he had a little bit of an accent going on, yeah. All right then, yeah. So it only made his master just like stick out that much more. Yeah, yeah, he does stick out a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, one thing I did—I forgot to mention when talking about Lee's character. I do like that he is somewhat you know, like his. Uh, <clears throat> he's definitely a character who is someone who is out for justice. Like you know, when something is done wrong, he wants to do something to correct it. Such as you know, avenging the death of his sister, who I gotta say, she, like, for for a female character who is you know, who is who is you know killed off, or you know, as some people might say, refrigerate, fr fridged, as a means of 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 uh, how would I say of motivating the main character to spring into action, she goes out like a like a champ, man. Yeah, ass kicking runs in that family. Yeah, uh, yeah. Like, that's a not, that's a great scene. Yeah. Where the guys are uh, are chasing her. That's a great scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, as terrifying um, as it is that these people want to physically and potentially sexually abuse her, it's like, nah, you you ain't having any of this, and ends up like you know killing herself before they have the chance to 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 uh, take advantage of her. All right. Well, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, the actress who plays her is a uh, was you know a, a, a regular feature in. Um, in, in, in some martial arts films, there there are a lot of really popular martial arts actors in this movie. As a matter of fact, uh, in in the very opening scene when we're introduced to Bruce Lee, mm -hmm. right before he has that conversation with that boy about emotional content, he's um he's sparring with uh, Sammo Hung, who is a famous uh, martial arts actor. Uh -huh. um, Jackie Chan is an extra in this movie. Yeah, yeah, I, I think maybe you might have told me that while we were watching the movie. I was like, oh shit, it's like. A, 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 it's crazy, like a, like a crossing of, of generations. 
Yeah. And then there's the big guy. Uh, Bolo is his name in the movie. I don't know what his actual name is in real life. He <laughs> Apparently was... it's it's also Bolo. It's Bolo Young. <laughs> Oh, okay, he 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 was um he was often billed as the the Chinese Hercules for good reason. Yeah, um, yeah. It's like I see him. He's like Jesus. This guy's been eating his Wheaties. He is a very frightening individual. Yeah, as you mentioned, and, he, he is he is essentially the Goro of this tournament. He is he is breaking people. Yeah, he has uh, a straight up fatality here. Multiple. <laughs> he breaks a couple dudes' necks and then he breaks that other guy's back. Like he does not mess around. No, no. Uh, I don't know what he. I don't know what he looks like now. He's seventy three years old, but I imagine he could still kick all of our asses. Uh, Probably, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's uh, that that that's that guy. Right. Um, let's talk about the uh, the the fight choreography in this movie. Okay. Uh, this is Bruce Lee. Um, favors uh, much more like grounded fight choreography in his movies overall, right. yeah. uh, which um, is a departure from. I mean, you, you get a, like a weird, like a crazy jump or something every now and then, but it's a far cry from you know. I guess some like, of some well, other martial arts movies that you may have seen clips of where people are flying around on wires and doing yeah. all kinds. Or of I guess like what would you call them, the Shaw Brothers? Are they the ones that make the more wacky, over the top style martial arts films? Yes, they also made Super Inframan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so none of that shit. Yeah, none of that. If, if, for a good example of that, we might watch uh, The Five Deadly Venoms at some point. That's another one of my favorites. Okay. Um, but, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot more grounded. It's it's very technical. You can watch these movies, and, and you know, a lot, a lot of it is very sort of, like... It's so realistic that you could you could almost like teach yourself how to fight a little bit by watching these movies. Uh -huh. Just just going like let, let's see how to handle this situation. Oh no, oh, look what he did there, you know. And a lot of people did. This <laughs> I see. The, the, there there was a mania in the seventies after this movie came out. Of right, I, I can see how people like like pe certain individuals within like the black exploitation genre were able to like self taught themselves martial arts just by watching these movies. Right, right. Anybody, go over to um, to to the channel that posts clips from Joe Rogan's podcast. Do it now before he moves to Spotify. Uh, there's there's a great clip where he's talking to Joey Diaz, and Joey Diaz is talking about like 1973 being a kid and seeing Enter, Enter the Dragon for the first time, and like the effect that it had on people, um, especially being like a like an immigrant. Uh, or from an immigrant family, uh, and that that'll give you some clue as to the the sort of cultural impact uh, at the time. But yeah, what did you think about the the fight choreography? The uh... it, it it was definitely wild, man. It was it, like uh, as someone I've always been a fan of the sort of classic style, uh, classic style uh, martial art like fight scene sequences because nowadays everything is done with quick cuts, uh, shaky cam. Uh, you know, stunt doubles, everything is so, like, everything feels a lot more artificial these days, whereas here it's like, they give you the best angle possible to view the entire, the fight in its entirety, and, uh, whenever they do, you know, change, change angles, they always do so in, in a, a very, like, fluid, n almost natural way, where it feels like you are there, you are a, a, a spectator, watching the fight unfold before your very eyes much like the rest of the 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 tournament participants who are circling around each and every fight and uh yeah. <clears throat> not only are what's, they what's, like, I, what's yeah. ironic is that it actually is somewhat fake in that bruce lee is having to hold back a lot <laughs> uh famously mm -hmm. they were uh, directors were always having to ask him to uh, go slower Down. because <laughs> often he would move so quickly that it would be difficult to uh, to capture his movements on film. Right, right. Um, and, yeah, it's not only does, like, each impact feel like it has weight to it, um, not only does, you know, does the... the, the uh, the the, chore the fighting choreography looks beautiful, almost like these characters are, like, dancing with each other, <laughs> dancing with their fists and feet. Um... One thing aspect of it that definitely screams that this is classic seventies martial arts um, cinema are the sound effects, and I feel oh, like yeah. beyond something like Power Rangers, this is like we don't re really get any fights anymore with the <laughs> and uh, 
it is kind of right. silly in a modern day sense. Like yeah, when somebody lands a punch, it feels like you just like dropped a big old package of meat on the counter. Like it's yeah. it's really loud and <laughs> impactful. Yeah, it it wasn't like like the the Indiana Jones movies where later on they added like a large bass sound where where you know every single punch to a Nazi's face would be like boosh. Um, a lot of it is definitely artificial, and so that could um take someone it, it could like uh what's the phrase um it could take someone by surprise and may take them a while to get acclimated to this like you know artistic style but um for me it kind of adds a lot of charm to the fights um and sort of adds that sort of level of fantasy over the top fantasy violence to the to the whole to the whole production absolutely absolutely uh, wow uh there's just there's so much to say and I and I don't know what to say next, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, so you, you get your first exposure to uh, to, to Lee's uh, to, to Lee's like fighting in general. You, you get to see the moves, yeah. as it were. Mm-hmm. It's good. It's good. A lot of that. Um, what about the what about the other people? What do you think about uh, John Saxon and Jim Kelly and everybody else who was uh, yeah who, uh, who got some shine in this movie? Let's see. I would say that. Uh... <clears throat> For John Saxon and Jim Kelly, both of them are, they definitely show some very impressive moves. And uh, I think they were successful enough at depicting these two individuals as people with skills com- somewhat comparable to, to Bruce Lee's. However, Lee, of course, is the main hero, so he gets to shine the most. And which makes sense, because, you know, he's the, it's clear that Lee, the character, and Lee, the actor, are most likely more than like more much more likely the most experienced fighters amongst the three of them but uh they still manage to make sax uh roper and williams fights uh equally entertaining as well uh especially with williams and his fight against han and it's like uh it's uh it's like almost like a tragic losing bad one-sided losing battle but it's such a great fight because it just shows just what sort of tricks Han has up his up his sleeve especially the moment where Williams uh, like punches his arm only to reel back and then later at the end of the fight it's revealed that Han has a metal, had a metal hand this entire time yeah, yeah that's or, all that's all great stuff yeah or the moment like at the very end of the movie where it's just a huge gigantic free for all where it's uh, Lee Roper and the freed slaves all fighting against uh, Han and his men, and so it's just like just constant fighting everywhere you go, and, and it's madness and it's chaos, and I can't even begin to imagine how long it must have taken to choreograph all of those fights happening at once. Oh yeah, everyone body was kung fu fighting, and they yes. were fast as lightning. Yes, <laughs> had, had had to get one in there. Of, of course, not, not proud of it. <laughs> but uh, but it's done. Uh, of course, it's not all fights, right? It's not all kung fu fighting. There's also a lot of very uh, there, there's a lot of uh, personality and humor in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, the, the example I think of is when um, that guy on the boat challenges Bruce Lee to a fight. Yes, like I, I mentioned before, like Lee is pretty stoic for most of the movie, but I did love this moment here. It shows a lot of personality and was a very nice uh, bit of character writing for him. Where like oh, yeah, yes. you continue. So yeah, he challenges him, challenges him. The asshole, the the racist jerk asshole, challenges Bruce Lee to a fight on the boat. And he has this really weird voice. I don't know what his accent is supposed to be, but he walks up just like, "What's your style?" And, oh yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, very cold accent. Yeah. Um. <laughs> and Bruce Lee sort of feeds him a couple lines, and then he convinces he convinces him to get on this boat. He's like, we don't have room to fight here. Let's get in this like little rowboat, and then we can, you know, separate ourselves from the ship and fight out out there. The guy gets in the boat, and then Bruce Lee just, uh, you know, releases the boat and uh, <laughs> Give, gives the rope the rope t- that's tied to the boat to the very like uh, employees that the the Cockney guy was making fun of earlier. And they proceed to drag him through the water as he <laughs> as he yells. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a great scene. Uh, and, uh, some some more humorous moments ha- happen when they're on the island, and uh, you know, Jim Kelly uh, picking out uh, four or five women from the lineup. 
right? For this, this sort, of, it's pretty much a straight to brothel, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what, these, what, these, what did these you are, think about these? Aren't morally superior individuals? I will say. No, I was going to ask you about this. What do you think about the um, the sort of more exploitationy elements of the film? That there is there is uh, there is a bit of uh, nudity. Uh, there's some nudity. We get some side boob. Yeah, some, yeah. Some, some some ass there, you know, some ass shots. Yeah. Did it take you by surprise? Were you expecting that sort of thing? I'm or not, uh... I wasn't quite sure, really, because, again, I've never been... This is my first time, you know, entering the world of, like, pure, you know, Hong Kong, you know, Chinese, like, martial arts cinema. And so I wasn't sure if whether or not this sort of thing was really common. Although I guess I was somewhat surprised, <laughs> because I know this is like a co... What is it? Like, like a Hollywood co-production... And I wasn't sure oh, yeah. if at this at so, this time. So Warner Brothers and um, Golden Harvest. Okay, so yeah, so with this being a, a Warner Brothers production, I understand like nudity in Hollywood movies. In in like, there's always been nudity in in Hollywood movies, um, but it's like I'm always never sure if they're ever willing to go that far. Yeah. Well, I mean, the '70s was a different time. Yeah. Uh, there were still porno. There were still porno theaters for crying out loud. You, you would go true. to a theater. You would go to a theater to watch a porno. I can't with, even with, with other people. <laughs> yeah, I'm not paying full ticket price for what fucking five minutes and then you're done. Jesus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that that's on you. That's on you, Dylan. There for finishing early. I mean, I guess you could stick around and. Although wait, I don't think you're allowed to even do anything <laughs> when you're in the theater. You're probably not, which makes it worse. Yeah. <laughs> what do you, you? What's the point? I, I don't know. Just to get the better sound quality and see it up on the big screen, get the big picture show. What are you there for the acting? <laughs> uh, maybe. Remember, this is probably the era of porno chic. This is when the thing when Deep Throat was a thing. When yeah, when pornos right. try to be actual movies. I guess you're right. They were, they, were Dallas, like movie, kind of shit. they were essentially movies with hardcore penetration. Yeah, I, 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 I guess you're right. I guess that was a, a thing. But anyway, still, I yeah, sorry. Still, I don't get it. Point being, the yeah. '70s was a wild time. Also, uh, when it comes, and, to, uh, when it comes I to, think they knew yeah. that this movie was going to be playing to more of a like an exploitation type audience. You know, uh -huh. the, the, the kind of people who were already into that to that sort of thing. Because I, I would imagine that that's the sort of people who uh, who, who uh, were watching the the the. the uh, other martial arts movies that were coming over to America and being dubbed. Um, yeah, that was, that old... would be my assumption. I would assume that they were just uh -huh. playing to the audience that they thought they were going to have. Mm -hmm. And they probably didn't realize the the wide success that the that the movie would wind up gaining. Uh huh. Like, uh, yeah. When I think like mainstream action movie, nudity isn't something that I usually see in a whole lot of those. Um... No, and if you do, you don't. You usually don't see much. Like think right. of uh, think about the the sex scene in Terminator, the first Terminator. Yeah, right, right. You see some stuff, but you know they they're cutting around it in like a very sort of like oh don't show too much sort of way. This right. is like prolonged. Like there's just a boob on the screen, and uh, then it yeah. gets up and walks away. Like <laughs> it's like it's like it's there and it's gone. It's never just like a, a prolonged full frontal shot. Yeah, it's shown in just a very sort of mundane like everyday sort of way which is almost more shocking because we're used to like nudity in films being the sort of thing that like you know again they have to shoot in a certain way and, like right to make it as it, as titillating as possible present it as like being like super tasteful and, like you know True. it's never just up oh, there's an ass walking out of frame <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> yeah like i think at this point the only time when i think of like nudity in film i think maybe I'll, it's mostly like like raunchy comedy, sex comedies, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You know, something like like Revenge of the Nerds, maybe, or Animal House. Yeah, that's probably the most common place where you would find that sort of thing. Hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, it it was a bit surprising. So I guess it was yeah, it was a bit surprising for me to see it here. And uh, just curious, is there any of that that sort of content in other Bruce Lee movies? Uh, I know that there is something in the Big Boss that's kind of similar, mm. involving a hooker or something. 
Yeah. Oh, I guess another thing I is don't, like I don't remember ahead. if there's any. I don't. I don't remember if there's anything like that in um, mm -hmm. Fists of Fury or Enter the Dragon. Okay, and uh, I know this is you know Chinese cinema, so um, I w honestly would have no clue. But I know like with Japanese entertainment, they tend to be very. Um, I guess conservative when it comes to displaying uh, nudity, which is very ironic given the sort the sort of adult market they have. But uh, for other, unless it's something that was like spe specifically made for a for a for a raunchy uh, genre, most of the times like most like uh, Japanese entertainment would tend to skimp out on on showing as little nudity as possible. I mean, heck, we never even, we were ever rarely, and back in those days in the Showa era, ever got to see characters kissing on screen. You know, I think about, like, other, like, Shaw Brothers martial arts movies that I've seen, and there's not a whole lot of, like, sex in general, you know? Okay, yeah. But it's it's usually much more like plot, like, here's your hero, and here's the, the quest that he's on. Right, you know, maybe there's watch the him. girlfriend or the wife or the love interest, maybe, but they don't hook up until, like, the the end, either at the beginning or end of the movie, I'm assuming. Right, and then it's like, usually there's, like, a specific style of martial arts that they're showing off in that particular movie, right. like, you know. Like yeah. Shaolin Mantis, where the main character uses Mantis style, or uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Five Fingers of Death, which is all about like you know iron like palm stuff. Huh. Uh, is that, yeah, there's not a whole lot of it. It might actually come more from this movie's sort of spy thriller element. Hmm. You know, right? It's very it's very sort of James Bond to go yeah. to this island and then the villain's like, "Hey, here's a feast. Want to have sex with one of my hookers?" Yeah. <laughs> uh, I forgot. Like again, I because like most of my exposure to James Bond is mostly like the newer stuff. But did James Bond ever had that much nudity? I don't think it was shown as explicitly, but he definitely got around. Well, I know. Yeah, it's definitely a lot of it is there. But I'm wondering if a lot of it was shown on screen or if it was like mostly implied. I, I think usually you'll see the girl like in bed and she's partially covered or you know mm -hmm. or it'll be like you know scantily clad people uh walking around and you, yeah. there's nothing quite like what you see here where it's like there's a boob yeah and yeah. Uh, there's an ass walking out, out of frame uh, yeah, just right. very just just very casual right right uh, <laughs> that that is true so it's it's, it's uh, definitely mm. not framed in the same way, but it's yeah. uh, th it is there thematically. Yeah. So I am kind of curious if whether or not like the lack of this sort of material was not present in a lot of martial arts movies because was it either because that simply was not you know a priority for these filmmakers or if it was just a more like conservative mindset behind them where it's like oh we right. don't feel comfortable doing this in the first place. I think it's a I think it's a combination of factors. You know, again, this is the early '70s. We're in the we're we're in the middle of this sort of like grindhouse sort of sexual revolution. Um, yeah, that there's a lot more. Hollywood is experiment is uh, allowing these sort of you know younger filmmakers to experiment with more like sex and violence. Oh yeah, oh yeah, because there was like none of that during the uh, what was it called, the Hayes Code. Right. Well, and then um, you know, the fifties and sixties, you know, the super really conservative strong. mindset. Yeah. Yeah, but then you know, the, the Hollywood was broke. Cleopatra, <laughs> yeah. Cleopatra broke Hollywood, and they were like, "We got to start taking some some risks on these like younger filmmakers who we can get for cheap." Mm -hmm. And so uh, we we wound up getting a lot more uh, a lot more action. Yeah. In, <laughs> in more ways than one. In, in various types. Uh, see, so yeah, I, th I think it's just, it's all of that. We're in the middle of this sort of grimier, like more exploitation cinema era. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got sort of a spy thriller plot. It's mm -hmm. like an island full of like sex trafficking and like drugs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think all of that just comes together. And as a result, we wind up with, uh, you know, boobs and asses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and and blood and gore and all that stuff. Well, not so much gore, but a, a, definitely a lot of violence there, and uh, yeah. backbreaking work, literally, quite, <laughs> quite literally. Uh, See what you did there. <laughs> uh, so speaking of like, the, I mean, yeah. I mean, imagine if Bane was able to break Batman's back 
without even having to use his knee. That's what that man did to that other man. Right. He just picked him up and like he was folding a piece of paper or something. Just, just <laughs> he friggin' per- like... He was performing origami with his body. You just hear his spine snap and then he drops him on the ground. And you're like, holy fuck. Yeah. Uh, I, I do remember like there was another backbreaking scene similar. Uh, another similar fatality where... Bruce Lee was fighting the dude who killed his sister and he ends up, it was like this brutal beatdown. He gave him the chance to walk away, but he like, he, you know, just to show what a, a irredeemable piece of shit he was. He took, he takes out like a, a smashes like a, a bottle, a wine bottle and tries to use it as a weapon. And that's when like Bruce Lee like jumps on his back and just like, I think it was in slow motion where he just like, you know, steps on his back and then twists his feet so that he can like perform the fatality. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> If there's one moment in this movie that comes off a little silly, Uh it's that moment because that slow motion shot of Bruce Lee's face, it lingers for a, for a a bit. Mm -hmm. And, and this expression on his face when taken out of context is very like middle of taking a shit. You know what I mean? Like it (laughs) looks like, it looks like he's on the toilet (laughs) or about to go super Saiyan. Yeah, <laughs> but he am no real super sand. No. So <laughs> I also love that moment in the fight. I think it's the, the same fight, the Bob Wall fight. Bob Wall is the guy who plays O'Hara, where um, he like jumps over him and Bruce Lee drops to the ground and does like a kick directly up into into the groin. Do you remember this? Uh, oh, I don't remember. When, when was this? I I think it was during that fight but it might not it might have been another it might have been another one of the fights okay oh wait yeah it was like i think we sort of mentioned that this it might have been like a uh uh inspiration for the johnny cage like ball busting move but he, like he didn't exactly punch him in the balls it was more like like right above the groin in a sense more in a still like sensitive area yeah yeah johnny cage is mostly inspired by john saxon in this movie oh totally yeah i can i can definitely see that with his with sort of like his his smirk and his care like uh his carefree attitude. Yeah. He definitely he feels a lot like that character. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and uh let's see. Uh well, yeah, go ahead. We haven't really we haven't really touched on uh the main villain, Han. What right. did you think of Han? Han, I feel like is a great villain. I mean he he's in mostly quiet for the most part, but he definitely has a lot of presence. And I love the scene where, you know, everyone is relaxing, eating and drinking and flirting with the girls inside the big palace. And then everything goes silent the moment he enters the room and gives his speech. And like, as soon as he leaves, then everyone is allowed to proceed as, you know, what they were doing beforehand. And, uh, you know, he's, he's someone who c- carries himself with a lot of uh, self-importance. And, uh, you know, he easily can back up his words through his own fists with uh, in his fight with Williams. The only thing that issue I had with Han as a villain is something it has to do with the the ending the fight scene. And this was something I mentioned to you um, as we were watching the movie where I noticed how Han, despite being the main villain, is pretty much taken care of rather easily by by Lee in the final fight. As amazing and like outstanding as that fight was was choreographed, you can tell that at at no point at, at like throughout the whole fight the whole climax brute lee was in control of the situation whereas i felt that it would have been more it would have made for better drama for more dramatic it would have had made for better more dramatic tension had like han been in control of the fight early on only for lee to come out on top by the end yeah or, or just have some back and forth you know right I, right I, I definitely see what you're saying there I mean, there's a little bit, you know, Bruce Lee gets roughed up a little, he gets some scratches. Very know? true, yeah. And I do like how Han was trying to use every dirty trick in the book as a means of having the one up on Bruce. Meanwhile, Bruce, it only, which only makes Bruce's accomplishments all the more outstanding, given that he's using, you know, he's fighting him with nothing more than his own bare fists. I remember you were very excited when we found out that, um, much like any good action figure, Han comes with um, interchangeable hands. Yes, like when they showed his like a uh, like what was it a uh, like a display of different hands. I saw like the skeleton hand. I was like, ooh, what if that's his original hand right there? And I see. Yeah, like, I believe the, that's I believe that's the idea because uh, Saxon asks him like, "What's that?" And he goes, "A souvenir." Right. <laughs> 
Uh, it could also mean that that could be like someone else's handicap. Like it would have been cool if he like if it was like uh, from Dark Man, where you know the dude collects yeah, the guy... fingers. <laughs> he collects yeah. people's hands. Yeah. Uh, that would but be weird. I saw the uh, the Wolverine claws. I was like, oh, I hope he gets to use that. And then he like he breaks through that glass container. He puts it on. It's like yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was, you're right. I was losing my shit. It's like, oh my god, this is amazing! <laughs> it's a unique feature. You don't see that in a lot of no, not villains. at all. And again, it's like, despite how old this movie is, it's like it's so many awesome badass ideas that can not that like I have rare that are rarely replicated these days. I also, I'm not 100% sure how they did it. Like, I don't know if his, the actor's real hand was just like up his sleeve, uh -huh. you know, like you do when you're a kid, because it didn't really, because it didn't really look that way. I don't know if maybe that actor really was missing a hand or what the deal was there, but it, whatever they did, it looked very convincing. I think what probably <laughs> happened was like, I think his, his, his sleeves must have been like wide enough for him to like bend his, his wrist at an angle to where you don't see it. And then once he puts on that hand, that like fake prosthetic hand, he can simply, you know, in another shot, slip his hand, real hand inside the prop. Maybe so. Maybe so. But again, whatever they did, it looks very real. This is pre-CGI, so it's not even right. a Lieutenant Dan situation. It's just really solid, uh, really solid uh, visual trickery, I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, also, super. But I definitely, I, yeah. I can definitely agree though with with your criticism of the fight in that mm -hmm. it, you never really feel like Bruce Lee is like his life is really in danger. With the mm -hmm. exception maybe of when he first goes into the mirror room and he can't tell where Han is. Right. Um, uh, it, it's a bit like after Goku went Super Saiyan, and after that point, it was like, oh, Freeze is just fucked. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or just a. Uh, yeah. 30 episodes with Frieza being fucked, basically, is yeah. what ensues. <laughs> right, or, 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 or you know, given on the, we're on the Frieza, the whole Resurrection F deal, where, like, the moment Goku says, yeah, you, you, you still don't know how to control this golden form, do ya? And then, like, all tension is, like, immediately dropped for the rest of the film. Until Frieza blows up the fuck. Let's give Frieza some credit. He blew up the damn planet. Yeah, I don't uh, know. I, I, gotta, I gotta say that was kind of an ass pull right there for the writers. Yeah. It's like fuck. We, we, we got like fifty minutes. We gotta extend this movie for another ten. How do we do this? Oh, he blows up the planet. Fuck it. <laughs> so, like, remember how long it took for Frieza to charge up that fireball to kill Blast Namek? What, what happened to that, Dylan? Well, that, that was before he trained <laughs> for like what five days or whatever. He didn't... Five days. <laughs> I don't remember how long it actually was, but you know. <laughs> They did that thing. In, they did that thing in the movie where they were like, "Oh, it turns out that Frieza has never trained a day before in his life. He was just a prodigy." So, imagine how powerful he'll get after he trains. And I mean, it worked because he fucking one-shotted Earth, you know, the entirety of Earth. He, well, yeah, but earlier in the movie than that, before he had even transformed, he like one-shotted Gohan right. in his first form. Why are we talking about resurrection? <laughs> no, I don't we're know. Not, we're not here to review resurrection. <laughs> we're not. <laughs> Uh, so, anyways, uh, with, with the fight with Han, uh, you know the the last part section of the fight. You know, I love how the fight get, is, the, is constantly changing locations, and it ends up in this you know beautiful, gorgeous uh, you know, mirror room with like tons yeah, of think, like armor and I weapons. Think, I think something like eight thousand mirrors in that room oh. lining those walls. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it that is a that is probably the most impressive scene in the film from a filmmaking perspective yeah because yeah. because you don't see the camera once right or i right. didn't i didn't anyway <laughs> yeah that, <laughs> Maybe that was like stupendous filmmaking right there yeah, again, i don't know how they i don't know how they did it but uh, they did it and this is something that like gives the movie its own ident unique identity that like other film, I can't see many people like successfully copy or imitate, or heck, even homage, unless this was like animation, which you don't have yeah. to worry about doing like mirrors or do worried about cameras. And you don't necessarily go into a martial arts movie like this expecting something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, a like really impressive, like you know, like visual, like just pure filmmaking sort of thing, like mm -hmm. the like like the zoom in and Jaws, or you know the that famous um, 
uh, pan shot from Wings where it goes over all those tables, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but but you get it, you get it in this mirror scene, you know, to film in a, in a room that is lined with 8,000 mirrors and to somehow hide the camera is is a feat that I don't know if, if everyone listening to this understands just how impressive that is. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but as people who, uh, who are enthusiasts about this sort of thing, well, let us assure you that is very impressive. Super, yeah. And again, this is the 70s, so no CG, you know, trickery here. Exactly. They could, exactly. They, they, this is a time where they couldn't edit it out in post. Computer? What's that, you know? Yeah. Maybe they had computers, but they were, like, the size of an entire, like, conference room. Yeah. And all they can print out were, were ones and zeros. Yeah. I remember those old computers that you used to see in movies sometimes, and they would, like, spit out a piece of paper with, like, dots on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's what I'm thinking of, too, yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I gotta say, like, the set design throughout this entire movie is, you know, is constantly gorgeous. Like, there is yeah. so much of... The, earlier you mentioned that, like, Oriental flavor, and I, I don't know if Oriental is still considered a bad, like, an offensive term. If it is, I apologize, folks. But it's like, uh, I guess, like, you know, Asian, you know, Chinese, Oriental, Asian, whatever. It's like, is that Chinese... Well, well, when I when I say Oriental... What, mm -hmm. what I'm thinking of is like a very sort of classical depiction of Asia. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is like that classic, like you know, not real Asia, movie Asia. You know? Yeah. True. True. Yeah. Yeah. This is it's movies like these that really like painted our Western view of of China and Asia in general. But I guess mostly China and Hong Kong, much like how anime gave us this, you know, warped distorted view of what Japan was like and you know whether or not it is you know an accurate depiction of, of Chinese culture or Chinese settings it looks constantly looks beautiful almost otherworldly especially from a western perspective westerners perspective um, even like in the docks of I think it was Hong Kong where you know um, all three protagonists were on boats and they were all heading towards the same location and they passed by all these random extras and, you know, this feels like a living, breathing world, and it probably was. Maybe they did shot it on location. In oh, yeah, there is a there is a ton of location shooting in this. I, I can confirm that. Okay, um, yeah. And again, those fields, those yeah. fields where all of the uh, karate people were standing outside going, yeah. ah, ah, all day. Right. Um, those were actually um, tennis courts, I think. Wow. That they, uh, that they found and uh, that, that, that they dressed up. Mm -hmm. to, to suit their purposes. But yeah, the production design on the movie is really fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the especially, especially when you actually, uh, especially when you actually get into Hans, like castle, because yes. that's probably the, the most artificial, like, like, you know, when they're outside, like in the streets of Hong Kong or whatever, that's a mm -hmm. whole lot of like location shooting right. uh, where the production design really shines is like, you know, in that feast scene, mm -hmm. you know, and there's like, bird cages hanging from the walls and all these like really interesting like shapes and like weird decor you know yeah all, and like there was probably a gong you know <laughs> somewhere mm -hmm. in there like just you know shit like that totally yeah and uh what else um i guess like the few scenes that, are su that supposedly take place in america which were like the <clears throat> the flashback scenes with uh with what was it, what was it, what were the characters' name? Williams and Roper. You can definitely tell that that was probably just like an oh, some like random grass field or a random street in the middle of of Hong Kong or China. Uh, but even still, it's very minimalist and it works at portraying these these scenes as being as taking place in another country. Absolutely, I said tennis courts before. They might have been soccer fields. Point oh, is, okay. it was a point is, it was like a a, a, a sports area right. that they. That they uh, dressed up and utilized for for their purposes. Right, right. Uh, let's see. So, is there anything else to talk about with this film? Since we t we've gone over the characters, the story, the the production value, the production values, uh, you know, the fight choreography, obviously. Uh, anything else? Did you have hmm. Did you have any other um, like minor gripes other than that thing with the with the fight scene? No, not really. It was just the ending. I feel like the ending could have been a little bit better, but even still, it was wonderfully executed, and it's something that I can easily forgive just because of how visually spectacular it was. Yeah. Also, I, I wanted to, to shout out um, John Saxon in the scene where um, 
where Han takes him underground and sort of shows him his operation. You know, he's trying to recruit him. Hmm. Um, that's a that's a great scene, and I think the actor does oh, a great yeah. job. Particularly when they come upon the the slain body of Jim Kelly. Oh yeah, yeah, and uh, the whole sequence does, definitely does feel the most James Bond. You know, with him, whether it's him like. Uh, Roper being taken, given a tour of the underground dungeon by Han, or uh, Lee, you know, sneaking around like a spy, like you know, fuck, like it's fucking Metal Gear Solid through the through that same uh, location. Uh, I also got flashbacks to terror, to not terror, uh, Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla with a with a similar set, underground sci-fi ish setup. Right, right, right. I mean, you know, I would point um, to. Uh... Doctor No, the very first James Bond movie. That, that's also a similar thing. Oh, okay. you know? yeah, yeah. Just in, any any movie in a in any moment in a spy movie where the the, the villain, you know, for some reason decides to to give the I, I mean, actually there's more of a reason in this because he's trying to recruit Roper into his into his um, organization. So at least right. there's actually like a logical reason. Usually in like one of those spy movies, it's just fucking Doctor Evil for some reason going like, "Let me show you my entire plan," you know. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, don't do that. <laughs> Not expected to die, Bon. Um, so yeah. I, 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 unless there's anything else that you can think of, I oh, guess see. we've kind of covered everything. Uh, I guess the nunchuck sequence with Bruce Lee is also really awesome. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Bruce Lee really uh, popularized the nunchuck. You would not have. Michelangelo wielding dual nunchucks and it had yeah. not been for Bruce Lee. Uh, in this movie and also in Way of the Dragon, there's some good nunchuck stuff. Right. Ah, a fellow chucker, I see. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, Ninja Turtles. I guess I can add that to my repertoire of of martial arts influenced uh, media that I, w I w grew up on. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Including Turtles 3, the, the greatest samurai film. <laughs> oh, that's that hurt to say. Um, <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, Kurosawa. We got Turtles 3. Yeah, we got... Who the fuck even directed that movie? Uh, <laughs> well, if I'm a turtle and I can't get up. <laughs> What's that? You got deep themes? Well, we got Tarzan, boy. <laughs> Whoa, 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 So what do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take that, Japanese-based, Japanese film scholars. Yeah, well, I, I guess we've covered everything, Andres. You know, yes. it, it really is a very simple movie. Right. But it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's essential viewing for this genre, and uh, I'm glad that you have been able to add it. To your repertoire indeed so uh with, without further ado do you now fully endorse enter the dragon yes always from here on out and, okay uh, one, I, one of these days one yes. of us is gonna is gonna recommend something and the other person is gonna hate it right uh, you know what i don't maybe it might have very well happen in the next episode but i i'll go into that once you're finished yeah i don't know when that's gonna happen but, but 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 it will happen eventually. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm surprised we've gone this long, but, honestly. But as it indeed. turns out, we just have very similar tastes. Indeed. Um, <laughs> and uh, hey, yeah. why don't you uh, uh -huh. why don't you tell them uh, what's so special about next week? Okay, so with uh, next week's episode, we're gonna have our second ever guest, which is the one and only Matt Burkett of Monstrosities, the Tokusatsu vlog channel, and so. If you have been a, a follower of Monstrosities, especially a follower of Matt's After Dark live streams, you may have seen a recurring film that has since kind of become an in-joke slash meme on his channel. Uh, whether when it comes to for you know anyone who is a follower of the of the live streams, especially the After Dark live streams, Matt constantly brings up one movie again and again and again, and that is none other than the infamous. Greasy Strangler, which uh, uh, all I know about this movie, it's about a greasy guy who strangles people. It was made in 2016 and is a black comedy horror film. 
And part of me is scared to, because he keeps hyping this up as like the trashiest, stupidest, most amazing movie ever. It's like this and Cats, uh, Cats 2019, are his biggest, guiltiest pleasure films. Oh, no. <laughs> and so uh, I, a part of me wants to see what the deal is, you know, what, 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 what all the hype is all about with this strangler of, of greasiness. Uh, so... When I asked him, it's like, do you want to be on this 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 year, this show? And he's like, uh, are there any requirements? And I told him, it's got to be something Dylan and I haven't seen. And he's like, well, you know what it is. <laughs> and so, yeah, part yeah. of me, it was yeah. it was funny when you when you floated the idea of, of having him as a guest. You said, listen, he's gonna re- he's gonna recommend one of two things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's either gonna review, he's either gonna rec- bring up Giver or the Greasy Strangler. So get ready, <laughs> Dylan. And wouldn't you know it, the, the Greasy Strangler was the fir- very first thing it was. I, I know nothing beyond what I've already told you. Apparently, like, I was expecting something like, the way he described it sounds like a, like a modern day trauma film. So I was shocked when I found out it was like made only like a couple years ago. So uh, part, I'm scared, I'm part of me is scared, but a part of me is really intrigued to see what the big deal is about this film. And so, yeah, I guess, I guess we'll find out soon. Right. I hope he doesn't strangle too hard. Too hard. <laughs> so, uh, take, uh, t- uh, you know, uh, what was it? Uh, you know, take us out, Dylan. Um, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly the way it's been. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, Super Team 64. And I have been Andres Perez, a.k.a. Kaiju Noir. And uh, we'll come back next time for uh, for that. <laughs> Until then, ladies and gentlemen, take care.